great to be back here at Furman. So I went to school here, as was announced. I started my journey here in 2003, and I would say that I was perhaps um, often feeling like I was going against the grain here. It was a different campus back then, that was about 12 years ago, and it's changed in many different ways. Um, so I was part of the Environmental Action Group, which I believe is a, is a student group that, was still, that is still around in some capacity today. And um, around 2005, I think it was, that my group of, uh, of friends uh, in the Environmental Action Group, we decided that we were going to have a referendum on campus. Um, we, we decided that climate change was a real concern and that there was a way that the university could take a bold initiative to address it. And the referendum would actually help offset our greenhouse gas emissions. And the way we were going to do this was by having a small uh, increase to student fees in order to purchase wind power credits to offset the emissions. Needless to say, um, the initiative or the, the referendum failed by a pretty significant margin. And it was around that time that I thought about um, what kinds of perspectives are really required uh, to address a complex issue like climate change. Um, and I wanted to think about how I could create an educational experience for myself here at Furman um, that would help me understand that. So I actually went about um, designing my own major. I, I borrowed from six different departments, everything from philosophy to economics and, of course, environmental science and biology, in, and packaged it into something called ecology and sustainable development. And, um, you know, studying a, a complex issue like climate change requires all these various perspectives. Little did I know then, of course, that this major, this experiment that I had created, would ultimately end up serving as the template uh, for what we know to be the sustainability sciences degree here today. Um, and I have to say that so much has happened in that amount of time here at Furman that it has become the university that I always wanted to attend. Um, and when I graduated from Furman in 2007, um, I wanted to experience um, the world outside through this collection of perspectives. Um, and the world of climate change, the debates um, have always been around different perspectives. Developed country versus developing, um, basically those that want to uh, focus more on behavior, human behavior change to address the issue, or those that want to focus on technological solutions, um, those that are skeptics about the challenge actually existing, and of course the overwhelming scientific consensus that this is a real problem. And nowhere is this issue more interesting to study than a place like India, a country of more than a billion people with, at that time, more than 300 million people without access to electricity and the need to bring hundreds of millions of people out of poverty while still keeping in check their emissions. So I packed my bags and I went to India, uh, very naive that I was going to solve India's climate and energy problems. Of course, that was not the case. Um, and also had the opportunity at that time to go to a very important conference being organized in Indonesia, which is not far from India. It was a UN Global Conference on Climate Change in 2007, and it was going to figure out what the post-Kyoto Protocol world was really going to look like. And what I learned through that experience was that there is a whole collection of young people that had mobilized, that had wanted a, a space to voice their opinions to the policymakers and translate the implementation of that at the grassroots level. But what I learned was that the, the opinions um, of the stakeholders that get ignored the most or taken for granted are the young people. Um, and that's important um, because amidst all the debating all the negotiation, all the old people that are really making the decisions, the people that will live out uh, the impacts of climate change are the young people. And having a seat at the table is very important. And, and I also learned that, you know, there are more organized groups of young people in many of the developed countries, but not so much in the developing countries. So I happened to go as part of the U.S. youth delegation, but was one of the only, I think, the only Indian youth representative there at the time. And I introduced myself to a senior government official. And I said, you know, I'm a youth delegate. And I was told very pointedly, youth should have the same view as their elders. And that was something that, you know, having grown up in the US, I couldn't, um, couldn't really stomach. And also just sort of my, my champions along, the, along my journey, uh, my family, friends, professors here, I knew that I had to have my, uh, my opinions and my actions be taken seriously. So I took to heart what this individual said. And I said to myself, next year I'll be back, and I'll be back at the negotiating table with you. Um, and that I would spend the rest of my fellowship year in India 
really trying to create um, an impossible idea come to life, to come to life. And um, what this really was, um, was an experiment that I didn't anticipate growing as big as it did. And it was incredibly empowering to me from a pretty young age. So in early 2008, um, a group of young people, myself included, we launched something called the Indian Youth Climate Network. And this was an impossible concept at a time when India itself was not taking a very pragmatic approach to its ability to act on climate change. We did not realize that choosing these four key words would bring so much international attention to what we were trying to do in, in the country, which was essentially change the narrative of we didn't create the problem and therefore we cannot act to one of a solutions-based movement and in showcasing and inspiring a nation into action. And one of the ways we did this um, was in early 2009. We, in what might have seemed like uh, a traveling circus, um, a collection of young people got together uh, in Indian manufactured, engineered and manufactured electric vehicles and traveled 3,500 kilometers from the southern city of Chennai to the capital of New Delhi to showcase the solutions uh, to climate change that the country had within it. Um, people thought we couldn't do it, and, and let me take a moment to explain why this was such a bold idea, and so many traditional players thought that we were crazy. Um, one being that at the time, you know, Tesla had only just released their first prototype vehicle to test their electric drivetrain, so nobody really had heard of them. Um, in India, 300 million people lacked access to electricity, and here we were, a bunch of young people self-organizing to travel across the country uh, among, uh, you know, amidst rolling blackouts to try and undertake this journey. The message was clear. We were going to create, communicate, and celebrate the solutions to climate change and really inspire the next generation of young people and older people uh, into what the capacity was for a nation to really address the issue. And I'm pleased that today we see the dialogue has been transformed in a country like India. Long story short, um, well, not the end of the story, but um, what the details that I, I don't want to spend too much time on, I came back to the US, I got a master's, I started a PhD program. I even had the chance to see how our own federal government works um, during my time at the Department of Energy and how we work collectively with other countries to help solve a complex issue like climate change through the lens of energy innovation. So I spent some time at the US Department of Energy uh, in the International Affairs uh, Office uh, managing the US-India bilateral energy relationship. And one of the really breakthrough projects that was launched uh, sometime in the late 2000s was called the Partnership to Advance Clean Energy Research. And the idea was really to provide more investments for critical research and broaden the geography of innovation, to have scientists and industry come together from these two countries and have a joint intellectual property sharing agreement for innovations that might come out of it. But more importantly, the impact of a project like this was really to transform the narrative of climate change from one of a blame game to one of shared and collective action. And really bringing together two countries that may seem poles apart uh, in the development spectrum to be able to come together in this space. In 2016, the President of the United States suggested that, uh, or declared, that we would be pulling out of the Paris Accord, the Paris Climate Accord. And there was a lot of um, dismay about this, a lot of concern among the environmental community and, and the community at large that care about this issue. But I think that there has been a surge of momentum to increase the ambition at the local level. And over the last two years, I've really decided to focus on throwing myself behind another impossible idea, that really, collectively, at the state and local level, we can really move the needle to address this issue. And I think this is important because states, they are the laboratories of innovation. They are the theaters of policy implementation. And ultimately, you know, places like Greenville, South Carolina, um, and Jodhpur, Rajasthan, which is the place that I was born, can have a lot to share and collectively act to address the issue. So over the last two years, my colleagues and I, we have been throwing our um, 
efforts behind a project, a really unique project called the U.S.-India State and Urban Initiative. And the idea is that we can bring together a new collection of state and local leaders to help address this issue. And the, one of the ways that we did this was in, in late 2017, we brought together nine U.S. states to be in dialogue with seven Indian states to talk about what the grid of the future really looks like. As we have more intermittent, cheap, renewable energy coming into the grid, we will need to find ways to store this energy. We will need to deploy a whole range of smart power technologies for better power management. And we'll have to deal with more people throwing solar panels and other types of technologies onto their own roofs and deal with the disruptions to the grid. And what we learned was, you know, having Missouri and Michigan and Nebraska and California, when you see them side by side with their counterparts from states like Uttar Pradesh, from Telangana and Tamil Nadu and India's south, that they have more in common, even though they're coming from such different perspectives, that they are trying to ultimately address the same sticky questions around managing their energy transition. More recently, we've brought together two states, one on each side, to have focused discussions around strategic energy partnerships and how they might learn from each other. And a really good example of this has been the conversations between the state of Colorado and the Indian state of Gujarat. And what I'm proud to say is that this new mode of trying to have a dialogue, a model process for engagement, is really possibly going to be the way to move the needle. You know, we can have discussions at the federal level, even at the international level, but the states will play a major role. And ultimately, be it Greenville, South Carolina, or the northeastern Indian city of Gohati in India's northeast, the solutions to climate change, the challenges of climate change that bind us together, also bind us in the search for solutions. Thank you. Thank you.